So I have a two-part question, and Please. both are really related to social norm. So before bit currency, and as a matter of fact, before centrally controlled currencies, people always barter. People even barter today. And I see Bitcoin perhaps will promote more of that barter of services for a exchange of bitcoins. That's one question. Is this really nothing but to promote more barter of services across the globe among people? And second part is, given that bit currency requires such technologies and access to computers and network, would you still leave billions of people behind who don't have access to the technology? Thank you. Those are two very good questions. Um, in mainstream economics, barter is considered an oddity because it only scales um, to very small levels. Uh, in fact, there's a close correlation between barter and the Dunbar number. Is anybody, anybody familiar with that? The Dunbar number is the maximum size uh, a social group can reach without trade, language, or currency. It's the limit to social organization in a flat, non-hierarchical structure. We first observed this in primates. Uh, the largest troop of chimpanzees, for example, that you will see before they split into two tribes and inevitably start fighting each other, is about 150 pe uh, members of the species. That's called the Dunbar number. We see that in human populations, too. It's why you feel at home at the village, because everybody knows everybody. It's where you can have social organization without intermediaries. Barter it only scales to that. And part of the reason it only scales to that is because barter creates this complexity of trying to price services in other services or products in other products. So if you're a hairdresser and you want chickens and you want to cut hair for chickens, you have to figure out what the exchange rate between ha haircuts and chickens is. But then if you want to um, get an oil change at the garage, you need to figure out what the exchange rate of hairdressers haircuts to uh, oil changes is. And then you have to keep this very complicated matrix of exchange rates between all of the products and services. We found a solution to that um, about 4,000 years ago called money. Uh, turns out if you just denominate everything in money, you have one exchange rate between money and everything else. And the best part of money is that it doesn't have intrinsic value or commodity use. Bananas aren't good money because then you eat them. Um, gold is good money because there's not much you can practically do other than jewelry. Um, abstract forms of money. Why is money uh, really useful as an abstract form? Because it turns out money is a language. Money is a means of communicating value to each other. It's a linguistic construct. It arises out of civilizations that have the ability to communicate. Um, we can teach it to primates. We can teach it to dolphins. We can teach it to elephants. Um, but money is a uniquely human thing because it's an emergent aspect of civilization. Money is useful because it has no value, other than the things you can exchange it for, which do have value, uh, intrinsic value, the things that you eat, for example. So it's not a barter system. In fact, once you realize that Bitcoin is the first form of completely programmable digital money, money that responds to inputs and creates different conditions, money that can be constrained in ways through programmatic technologies. For example, you can create Bitcoin or other digital currencies that are only spendable if you have two out of three signatures in a governance system. So you can say, oh, for this account, the CEO and the CTO must sign. Um, in order to spend it. That's a simple example of what we call a smart contract in this space. This is a lot more than barter. The second thing relates to technology. And I would agree with you. you know, there is a prerequisite of technology. And right now, of course, the people who use this technology are primarily educated, techno te uh, technologically literate, and fairly affluent uh, uh, people. But that's not how it's always going to be. And I think one of the great parallels to this is the development of cell phones. Now, I don't know if you remember, I got my first cell phone in 1991. It was about this big. Uh, it lasted 15 minutes for a call on one battery charge. Uh, and I had to be near a, a station to actually use it. And I was so cool, because I was in college, right? So I was like, hello. Um, at the time, we had just emerged from the environment where in order to have one of these portable telephones, you needed a car to install it in. And we had migrated past the, it's the size of a suitcase that you have to carry, right, with a little headset that you pulled out, um, and had finally reached full portability. It was a status symbol. Who thinks a phone is a status symbol today? In fact, 
it's, it's more of a status symbol to have your assistant carry your phone. The most po powerful people in the world don't answer phones or carry them. They have an army of people carrying phones for them. The status symbol is to leave it behind. Who has phones now? The most po produced phone in the world is the Nokia 3000. It's been produced by the billions. You will find it in the furthest parts of the Brazilian uh, Amazonian basin. You will find it in sub-Saharan Africa. The tiniest village that has nothing else has a solar panel and a Nokia phone. The sound of civilization arriving in the world today is do 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 boop. Remember that sound? Um, that's how that technology evolved. And what if we can take Bitcoin and put it on those devices? So now we're seeing this happening with Android devices. The average price for the cheapest Android phone you can get is about twenty-five dollars today. Um, most experts believe that by the next three years you'll be able to buy an Android phone, a full smartphone with, say, an ARM Cortex processor for about a dollar. Now, what happens when this one dollar device is simultaneously a Western Union remittance termination point, a Wells Fargo wire transfer station, a Bloomberg terminal for trading stocks? What happens when that device is a bank? and you can hold it in your hand and be a banker. So we will not leave billions behind. Um, in fact, we will deliver a bank to the pockets of seven and a half billion people with this technology. The goal of Bitcoin is not to bank the world. It's the goal of Bitcoin is to debank all of us. <laughs>